What is going on, investors? Hopefully, guys are doing well out there. That is right. It is Sunday here on the Investor Channel, where normally every Friday we join you for the Fang Stock Recap Show, where we recap all the news and the technicals from the major Fang Stocks here on the show. When I'm feeling better, we had to delay it a little bit until Sunday morning. Let's not waste any time. Let's kick things off with Facebook. Started the week at about $334 per share, basically ended the week flat at about $335 in the after hours trade. Now, Meta Platforms is being probed by the FTC. Again, nothing new if you've been following the channel and these companies for any length of time. This over a $400 million deal for a fitness app called Supernatural. So the FTC is pumping the brakes on this deal and at the very least going to put this off into the future to a certain later date. Now, one thing that we can talk broadly about is $400 million is not a lot of money, when, especially when you're talking about any of these companies and particularly Facebook as well. And my thoughts broadly is, look, when you look at Washington, you look at the Democrats and the Republicans, they both hate these companies and they're both doing their best to help these, like stop these companies from growing via acquisition. And so I actually think that Facebook and all these companies should really change, change their strategy instead of trying to acquire these companies for $400 million. Look, Facebook can hire their own fitness instructors. They can build out a studio. They can build this content out themselves and not have to go through all this rigmarole trying to get these regulators to allow this to happen. We'll see if that's the strategy going forward because this would really put a crimp on metaverse's strategy in terms of of pivoting the business and investing in these other companies and investing in metaverse type software companies. Well, if the FTC isn't going to allow them to do it. I don't think the current administration is going to do it. And if they get reelected, they sure as heck aren't going to change their mind. And if they don't get reelected in a few years, I don't see a Republican or any other party, unless you get like a libertarian or something winning an election, which is not going to happen here in the United States. I don't see either party allowing these companies to grow via acquisition. I think they should just do everything in-house and we'll see if they change that strategy. Now, I just went on a long rant about how regulators aren't going to allow these companies to grow via acquisition. And here's an example of them allowing them to do that. So a customer deal, the customer is the name of the co company with a K, and that deal is, looks like it's winning a conditional OK from, this is from EU regulators. Now, customer sells a customer relation manager management software and Meta's idea is they're going to stack this on top of WhatsApp. And look, I'm a casual user of WhatsApp. I don't use it very much anymore, but I know enough about businesses and I've seen enough businesses that use this app like it's their main source of communication for their business. And so adding another layer where it allows businesses to really use WhatsApp even more for their daily use, I think really solidifies WhatsApp and could create more monetized activities on that app, allow Facebook to make even more money than they already do on WhatsApp. Now, Instagram, another meta company, surpassed $2 billion, two, excuse me, 2 billion monthly active users. So we're talking about people here. And I don't think this necessarily comes as a surprise to anybody. This actually came in the fall. They surpassed 2 billion monthly active users over at Instagram. Now, moving on to Apple, slid down a little bit this week. Okay, started the week at about $180 per share, ended the week at about $171, $172 per share share. Now, Apple is building a team to produce wireless chips in-house. And here's what I, you know, the first rant that I went on with Facebook. Here's what Apple is doing, okay? They're building their own silicon, okay? They've been doing that for a while with the iPhone, but they decided to do that. With, and when I say building, they're really designing it and they're using their partner TSMC to really do the heavy lifting and actually manufacturing those chips. But it's a really good partnership. And now what we're seeing is they're building their own in-house like modems that could eventually replace Broadcom and Skyworks in terms of what Apple uses inside their products. Now, I read a lot of commentary on this and a lot of people say, hey, it's super hard to build this. Apple will need a partner. I wouldn't, that doesn't surprise me. It could be that Apple already has an agreement or already has talked broadly with Broadcom about, hey, if we design our own modem chips, will you manufacture them for me? That could be in the works. It could be there's another company out there that is starting to develop these capabilities. It could be that Apple really creates a new process 
process and a new way to develop these chips. Because when you read like Broadcom, like people that are bullish on Broadcom and Skyworks, they'll say, no way Apple's able, no way Apple can do this on their own. Guys, Apple has like $200 billion in cash. They can borrow almost an unlimited amount of money, okay? This company can build this in-house if they wanted to. My guess is they're gonna take over the design and then they'll partner with a Broadcom. They'll partner with the Skyworks. They'll partner with somebody else with the capabilities to actually produce those chips. And I think this is a smart strategy, especially when you look at the M1 chips, how successful those have been, not just from a performance perspective, but when you look at a profit perspective, Perspective with Apple, the margins have expanded in those categories. And this is probably another way for Apple to squeeze a little bit more margin out of their business. Now, Apple's iPhone supply in China is getting, quote, better, and it has solid demand in China. We've seen a lot of anecdotal reports. And look, I think the Apple, I think you could just look at the stock chart of Apple over the last month or so, this stock is steadily going up. So investors are betting that, look, the iPhone is its biggest profit center and its biggest revenue center. So I think investors are lining up behind this. Also, what we have to keep in mind is, look, whether they sell 30 million iPhones phones or 28 million. It doesn't really matter. The key is, is that Apple gets people in that ecosystem and then they, they subscribe to the iCloud. They subscribe to Apple Music. They subscribe to their services. When again, when we recover the financials of Apple every, every three months, look, that service segment has like 70 or 80% gross margins. That's really what we're looking for with Apple. We're just trying to get people into the ecosystem and then sell them those high margin services business. Okay. We make about 30% on the hardware side and then we make 70 to 80 percent on that service side so that's basically what they're doing over at apple amazon started the week at 3415 and like for the last year stock's basically flat end of the week at about 3400 bucks ironically enough not a lot of news out of Amazon this week. Nvidia started the week at 299, slid down. We'll talk about all these stocks from a technical perspective, but certainly when you go from 300 down to about 280, we'll talk about that from a technical perspective with Nvidia. Like Amazon, not a ton of news out of Nvidia over the last week. Moving on to Google, started the week at $2,948. End of the week, just slightly flat. I think we're in a sideways consolidation pattern with Google for the foreseeable future, unless they, when they report earnings, probably in about 30 days or so, that could skyrocket this company to that next level. End of the week at about $2,843 I see here in the after hours. Now, ABC, ESPN, Disney, and some other channels owned by Disney, that falls off the YouTube TV. Now, YouTube TV is something that I have, and yeah, ESPN is gone, but luckily you have other ways to access these things. What it did for people that own YouTube, YouTube TV, that's a mouthful, okay? You went from $65 a month, and that cuts the price down to 15. Now, these carriage deals, these deals, so there's a deal in place between YouTube and Disney. Obviously, Disney controls ESPN, ABC, and those two combined. And basically YouTube TV charges a monthly service fee and then they pay Disney for the rights to these content. Well, those run on contracts. And when those contracts come to an end, there's usually a little squabbling period, but usually they get things worked out before the channels actually get cut off the service because it is a negative look. If you buy YouTube primarily to watch ESPN, primarily to watch ABC, or even to watch it kind of casually, this really hurts and it might force you to switch. And so it hurts YouTube to a certain degree. So Disney, I think in this case, probably playing hardball, maybe, maybe because Disney has the ability now to go to you directly as the customer, okay? They have Disney+, Plus, they have ESPN+, Plus, they have Hulu. They have ways for you to come directly to them for this content, where in the past, just two or three years ago, you pretty much had to go to somebody else in order to access this content. So maybe this is a sign in the future that Disney is just going to straight play hardball with these companies and not allow them to kind of wring their neck. So Disney's playing hardball. I think here because I don't necessarily think YouTube TV is a big profit center and certainly from a revenue perspective over at Google, not necessarily that big of a deal. And so I think they just looked at this like, hey, well, Disney's really starting to play hardball and Disney's has started to go the other way. We'll see if these companies are able to work something out in the coming weeks and months ahead. 
and we'll see what happens there. I just thought that was kind of interesting, and I think it says more about Disney than it does Google. Now, moving on to Microsoft, start of the week at 340, end of the week much lower at 324. We'll talk about from a technical perspective, can we come in here and buy that one? Now, Microsoft's top priority in 2022, some people say it could be data management, which really, if you look at like Oracle, that's kind of their bread and butter, and Oracle stock is really have taken off over the last couple months or so. Man, that stock is definitely worth looking at in terms of its performance. And they're basically kind of a database company. And this is kind of arguing that Microsoft may be able to go into that market and capture a little bit more of that. Obviously, they're going to be a well-oiled machine when it comes to Xbox and Microsoft Optif. And certainly Azure is certainly running on, uh, you know, doing a very nice job in terms of its revenue growth rate. But I think we're just all expecting Microsoft to have a really solid 2022 and we'll see if it meets investors' expectations because, boy, this stock has really gone up over the last year or so. Now, moving on to Tesla, start of the week at $993, slid down to about $931 per share. Really interesting from a technical perspective. Has it hit those areas of support that we talked about last week? Has it broken down below it? We'll talk about that with Tesla, and I tell you what, this upcoming week, even though it's probably a little bit shortened and it's probably going to be a little bit lighter trading week because you have the holidays coming up this week here in the United States and around the world, quite frankly, well, we'll see what happens with Tesla this coming week. It could be a critical week from a technical perspective. Now, EV stocks, including Tesla, including Rivian, they tumbled after Rivian reported their earnings. You might have viewed my video on Rivian, and a lot of people thought I was really critical. Some people either really like it or they think I'm short the stock or something like that, and that's not the case. And I probably should have said on that video that I'm extraordinarily bullish Tesla, but it's for a number of different reasons. Number one, you can always know here on the channel, any company with negative gross margins, not net margins, I understand companies lose money. Not that big of a deal, especially when you're Rivian and you're kind of a startup, but it's the gross margins perspective. Look, I got too many companies that I want to invest in and I want to put my money into. I don't got time for negative gross margins. But really what we saw was Lucid went down. All these, basically every EV stock, even the Chinese ones, Li Auto, Neo, they all went down and then we saw Tesla kind of get dragged down with it. I actually think this is more or less just profit taking. All of these stocks have had incredible growth and I think the industry is just taking a breath, realizing that Tesla is really out in front of all of these companies in terms of deliveries, in terms of capacity to actually deliver and make, more specifically, make these cars and deliver them, that the whole industry is just taking a step back. Now, Elon Musk unloaded another $907 million worth of Tesla stock. That takes his sales to about $12.74 billion. And I think when he first started this, there was a CNBC article that estimated that he had a $13 billion tax bill. And so this takes us to about where he is. We're also getting towards the end of the year. You'd have to assume that Elon Musk is trying to satisfy the sales of Tesla probably in this calendar year in order to meet his tax obligations whenever they're due, whenever he decides to pay them. So this is just me speculating to a certain degree, but I'd have to imagine that Elon Musk is probably towards the tail end of his his unloading and these headlines of him selling quite a bit of shares. I think he's probably trying to get to about 13, 14, maybe even $15 billion worth of sales. Again, he owes the federal government and out here in, in California close to $13 billion. And yeah, you're going to have to raise some money when you owe those governments and those tax agencies that amount of money. Now, Elon Musk won a series of awards this week from Time Magazine to Financial Times. He won the Person of the Year. And then he kind of had some Twitter battles with uh, Senator Warren. And look, I, I, I don't know. I think Senator Warren is playing politics. I think she's an extraordinarily savvy politician. She's gotten a lot of attention on herself. And that's the the name of the game in politics, okay? There's so many senators and Congress people that we have no idea who they are. Senator Warren is probably in the top 10 of all politicians in the United States that you know. You know where she stands on things. You know where, you know, you know her ideals. You know what she looks like. You know what she stands for. 
I actually admire that, okay? Whether or not I agree with her or disagree with her, it really doesn't matter. So she's kind of piggybacking. I actually think she's doing this very, she's very savvy in this. She's actually piggybacking off of Elon Musk's attention because as we know, Elon Musk gets as much attention out of anybody, especially when we talk about CEOs and executives in the stock market. He's got to be number one, okay? Especially with Jeff Bezos kind of t bowing out and Tim Cook kind of being more of a private guy. Elon Musk, absolutely the most eccentric and absolutely the most recognizable CEO in all of Wall Street. And I think Senator Warren is doing an absolutely fantastic job getting on his coattails and getting attention. Because look, the people that supported her before are going to support her and the people that don't support her don't. And so I think this is a fantastic thing. I respect Elon Musk for standing up for himself, but I also respect what Senator Warren is doing as well, quite frankly. Dogecoin gained 26%. Remember Dogecoin? As Elon Musk said, Tesla will accept it for some merchandise. Now, I haven't logged onto the Tesla app and see if I could actually spend this with Dogecoin or how I would able to do that. But this is not Tesla cars. This would likely be t-shirts. This would likely be the number of it. So I ordered my Tesla. I had to buy tint. I had to buy floor mats. I had to buy floor mats. I had to buy all this little extra stuff, little hubcaps for the wheels, all that types of things. So you get a base model with a Tesla and then you have to buy all these accessories. Well, apparently you're going to be able to buy some of that with Dogecoin. Now, this is really interesting. So there's a new California proposal. Obviously, I'm out here in California. I just put solar on my roof. This actually really impacts me and it would reduce the subsidies for the solar industry. What it would do specifically is when you, so you put a solar panels on your roof and often during a summer day, unless you're running your air conditioner and playing games and running all this high power equipment in your house, more often than not, your solar system actually produces more energy than what you're using in your house. So the rest of that energy gets fed back into the grid. Now, my agreement is a little bit different. I already don't, I basically sell it back into a grid at a much, much lower rate. I, we're talking like a wholesale rate. Now, most of state of California actually isn't on that. You're actually selling that power back in at about the price that you would pay for it as a retail customer. What they're looking to do is actually change everybody to where I'm at. When you overproduce, you actually pay it back into a, you actually get a credit, but at a much, much lower rate. Also, what they're looking to do is actually tax you for your solar panels. Believe it or not, California going to tax you on your solar panels. I think it was like $8 a megawatt or something. It worked out for about $40 per house. So I'd have to pay $40 or $50 a month just because I have solar. Now, what I thought was interesting, it's not being discussed a lot about, again, this is just a proposal by the California government. My guess is there's been a lot of negative attention on this. It'll probably be worked out in a slightly different way. You also have a long uh, kind of a, a waiting period on this. So it might go into effect maybe next year, maybe the following year, but then there's kind of a grace period or kind of a grandfathering in period where it'll take a while. I think me personally, I'll be grandfathered in for 15 years. So that's a pretty long time. But what it did incentivize is actually the Powerwall batteries that Tesla manufactures and the LG and a couple of others actually make these. So that's where you put this battery in your house and when you're producing excess power, instead of it going back into the grid at a wholesale cost, you've plug into your battery, you charge your battery in your house, then at night when your solar is not working, will you actually pull off your battery inside your house? I think that's a tremendous idea, but when I installed solar, they told me to wait because battery technology, as we know, Tesla is working on a new battery for all their EVs. And so the solar company that I went through was very knowledgeable, very nice people. And they told me just wait because the technology is getting better. And when you look at what Tesla is doing with the batteries inside their cars, it'll apply to what they're doing in those power walls as well. And so there's going to be a tremendous amount of innovation in terms of storage of energy in batteries from a home perspective. And so we'll see those developments. But this is something worth watching if you're invested at all in solar stocks. So this is Enphase, this is Sun Power, this is First Solar, certainly to a certain degree Tesla as well, though it's a very small part of their business. You need to watch this very closely because the California solar market is basically the solar market. And if they really, really change things, 
you want to be up on that. Now, the President Biden and Vice President Harris released an electric vehicle charging action plan. And when I read through this plan, for the most part, it's setting up committees. It did set aside some money, I think about $3 billion of grants and those types of things. More than likely, this is probably not going to apply to Tesla. But when you look at the amount of charger networks that need to come online, it is a lot, especially when you see makers like GM and Ford and certainly a Lucid and a Rivian eventually as well deliver tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of cars at some point. Well, you're going to need a lot more charger networks. Now, Tesla has a big competitive advantage in that space. And so I actually think they'll be able to capture a lot of this. And then when you look at anything, when the government is involved, there's all kinds of talking. There's all these offices. There's all these bureaucratic jobs that get created. These people make 60, 70, 80, $100,000 to sit behind a desk, not go out and actually build chargers. This is going to take a lot longer. Anything that government does, it takes longer and it's more expensive, okay, for a broadly speaking, okay? I think we could all agree on that no matter how we vote when it comes to voting. So we'll see what happens here, but they did set up this action plan and we'll see how it moves forward from that perspective. Now let's look at the technicals on this one. We've taken a look at Facebook. Now this one's done something interesting. We are in a downtrend, okay, with Meta. It's So we created a high up here, a lower high. It looks like we're in the midst of creating a lower high again. We talked about last week, if we couldn't get above 340 and more specifically 350, well, this downtrend is still intact. I would expect if we have light trading next week, it's hard to bet what's gonna happen next week. But once full trading kind of comes back, it really takes about two weeks. Because look, if you're doing well on Wall Street this year, you're gonna take two weeks off like everybody else does, okay? And so there could be some opportunities to buy these stocks if the volume is really thin and the news is kind of negative, the sentiment is kind of negative, if you got a lot of focus on rates and Fed action, well, it could push stocks down. We've seen over the last few weeks, stocks, especially high flying ones, and really speculative stocks have really been beaten up over the last few weeks. These FANG stocks have actually held up brilliantly, especially when you compare it to the more speculative stocks. Well, I think that could happen, affect all these stocks. You're buying opportunities with Facebook, in my opinion, are 320 at the earliest, but more specifically, I think if you get to 310, you're retesting probably 310, 300 on this one is where I'm really looking at when it comes to Facebook. Moving on to Apple, looks a lot like the Nvidia chart. So you broke to all time highs. This is why we focus on those all time highs because man, I know a lot of traders. And when I say a lot, a lot of the traders that I talk to at conferences, just talk to casually. Okay, they love the breakout trade. Okay, especially in a bull market. Okay, a bear market would be completely different. Okay, but in a bull market, the breakout to all time highs is a powerful thing. And we saw it with Apple. Once we broke above 157, we hesitated for a minute, but then we boom, rocketed all the way up to 182. Like Nvidia, we've kind of pulled back. It could be that we're just starting a new consolidation area. It's too soon to tell. There's not enough price action up here with Apple. If you're like me, you already have plenty of shares of Apple. Just kind of waiting, okay? If you're a newer investor or you didn't, you're, you just didn't have a, a full allocation of Apple, you're just looking for an area where this starts to, you know, kind of settle out a little bit, okay? Because look, Facebook did the same thing. When it broke to all-time highs, it went from 310 up to 390, but then pulled all the way back to 310, okay? We'd actually probably expect a similar type action with Apple. We're actually probably looking for this to, at very least, come back and retest some of these areas, but it could come all the way back to 157. And that, in my opinion, would be a first area where I'd be really thinking about buying this one again. Now, the situation is complicated a little bit. In the next 30 days, we're likely to hear earnings. In January, we're gonna hear earnings from all these companies. And that could really complicate things, okay? What the stocks do heading into that news and that announcement will certainly be interesting to see. And we'll obviously monitor that very closely here on the channel. Moving on to Amazon. This one, like we've talked about, has been in sideways consolidation since June and July of last year. We've basically consolidated really on the low end down here at about 2,900, but more specifically at about 3,000 
up to about 3,500. You've been in a $500 range. When you look at this chart, the vast majority, I would say 99% of the candles are between those areas, about a 500, literally a $500 range, which is a really tight range when you're talking about a stock that's $3,000, okay? $500 is a really small percentage of $3,000. So, but what we talked about, so I had this upward channel. This was drawn in last week. We could probably tilt this down now. It could be that we're here. We'd look, if we're bullish Amazon, we want this thing to just keep going up because if you're like me, you're overweight and it makes the performance of your portfolio look really good when this stock goes up. Well, we'd want this area to hold and then move back up into this $3,500 level. On the really bullish side, we're looking like like an Apple and a Facebook and an NVIDIA. We're looking to break above all-time highs, which on Amazon is up over $3,700 per share. But if we break below this, again, if we have negative sentiment on the news, then trading could push these stocks down. Anything below $3,300 on Amazon would confirm that this uptrend that we've kind of identified, okay, low, higher, low, a little bit of a blowout. But even if you come back here, this is basically a low, low, higher, low. And if you can keep moving this forward, that would be a continuation of this uptrend. If this uptrend is broken, you're coming south of 3,300. You get this stock south of 3,300. I don't necessarily think that's a bad buying opportunity. Moving on to NVIDIA looks a lot like Apple, right? Okay, we broke above all time highs a few weeks ago at 230 blew up all the way up closer to 350 now we've pulled back we're kind of in a consolidation area so i had this lower trend line i'm going to drop this down now because it looks like our candles are starting to bottom out here down here at about 280 looks like we're consolidating between 280 and 330 this is not an area where i'd want to step in and buy because look at what you have underneath 280 like almost no candles i mean this is like a rock skipping across the water it's just nothing Okay. And so you leave a lot of airspace whenever you do that. And so if you get negative segment in this name, if you get negative sentiment in the market, well, this thing's going lower. Okay. I actually, the way this is starting to set up, I, it wouldn't surprise me if we break this 280 level and we start coming down here. Now, will we come all the way back and back test 230 like we did with Facebook when it broke to all time highs? I'm not a hundred percent sure. There's a lot of people that probably weren't in NVIDIA compared to like an Apple and a Facebook, which are much more well-covered stocks and stocks that were in everybody's portfolio before the breakout. NVIDIA, not necessarily the case. So as this thing starts to pull back, investors might start piling into this one. We'll see if that materializes. You also have a lot of volume. Okay, this is what I'm kind of talking about. Just from a psycho psychological perspective, again, not a lot of people were in NVIDIA. And so when it broke to all-time highs, you had a little bit of FOMO when you look at this volume. There's a lot of volume here, okay? And so if that volume starts to dry up and the buyers start to dry up over at NVIDIA, well, this one can go lower. The first area, me personally, that I would look at this one is about all the way back down to about $230 per share. Moving on to Google. Okay. So what I'm going to do is take off some lines because I don't think they apply anymore. I don't think that line applies anymore. I don't even think we need this one anymore. We're basically in a new, what I would consider kind of a sideways motion with Google. We're down here buying opportunities at 2,700 and you're looking for either a breakout or if you do want to take profits, which from a buy and hold perspective doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but you could take profits on Google up here at about $3,000 per share. We're sitting at about $2,900 per share right now. We're a little higher than just the middle of the range. When you have these epic runs, I mean, this is just a gigantic run that Google went on it makes a ton of sense that we go sideways. When you look at the Amazon chart as well, that stock just basically been going sideways for well over a year now. Wouldn't surprise me. I'm not predicting that Google goes sideways for a year, but wouldn't surprise me at all if this stock just kind of goes sideways for a little while. Again, what complicates the situation a little bit is you've got earnings for all these companies coming up in January. So we'll see how these stocks react kind of to the setup to that. And then there's obviously the reaction to earnings as well. Moving on, on to Microsoft. This one obviously looks like NVIDIA, looks like Apple, looks like Facebook did a, a, maybe a month or so ago. This one broke to these all-time highs. Now it's consolidating sideways. Now we had this area marked out at 330. We broke that 330. We're now down here to 324. My analysis on this is exactly like NVIDIA. I wouldn't want to touch this one because we have no candles, basically no. I mean, we have like six candles between about 305 on this one up to about where we're at at 300. 
$125 per share. So if we get negative sentiment in this name, or the stock market, or both, this one is coming back and it's likely gonna come back pretty swiftly. You do have a lot of volume right here at this peak, just like, in, I mean, these setups are identical. And I tell you what, if you're a tech, much, much better at technical analysis than I am, this is probably, you could trade these stocks identically, okay? They've both broken to all-time highs and really skipped a ton of price action, and now they're flagging sideways. I think you could read this two different ways. It could be very bullish, but it also could be very bearish. Me as a buy and hold investor, I'm probably, bi I am biased that this one will go down. I actually want this stock to go down, believe it or not, because I wanna buy more. This is how I wanna build my wealth over the next, I'm almost 40 years old in a few weeks. I still have 10 to 15 years where I'll be accumulating stocks, okay? And these are probably my prime earning ages as a, 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 an investor. And so I want to be accumulating stocks like this. So I am biased. Understand whenever you watch videos of me, I'm actually biased to the downside. I actually want these stocks to go down because again, I am trying to accumulate stocks over the next 15 years and then the last 10 years, 60 to 65, 70 years old, uh, hopefully be pretty healthy and live pretty long, hopefully cross my fingers, or at least my kids will be able to inherit a nice portfolio. Either way, it wouldn't really matter to me, but I am biased to this one going down. But from a technical perspective, if you get negative pullback on this one, it could drop pretty quick from about 325 to 305. I would not be concerned about that. I would actually be looking to buy it down here at that $300 range. Moving on to Tesla. This one's not doing anything that really concerns us right now. Yes, it's gone from 1250 down to 930. We've talked about the back test all the way to $900. That's what this one's looking to do. And look, this is what we're looking for when we're looking at Microsoft and we're looking at Nvidia as well. Those stocks are still up here. That's why when I look at Tesla, I start thinking, wow, I could have this opportunity in Microsoft and Nvidia and maybe even Apple here in the coming weeks ahead, if they pull a Tesla and go from all-time highs all the way back to back test this $900 level. This $900 level, I think, is a buying opportunity. And again, what I identified on our show last week was we're still in this kind of upward uptrend, okay? This stock is still in an uptrend, believe it or not. Even though you've gotten from 1250 to 930, yeah, if you just bought in, you're feeling a little bit of pain, but this stock is still in an uptrend. And being down here at $900 is not concerning. Now, if you break 900, I wouldn't be concerned, but yeah, this stock is coming much, much lower. And I would actually get excited about that personally. I think you could have some excellent buying opportunities down here. Now, if I were to place a wager, if I were to actually place a trade on this one, I would actually expect us to hold this $900 level and start traversing upwards, not necessarily all the way back up to 1250 anytime quickly, but I think we could hold the levels. If it doesn't, again, that's very negative from a technical perspective. You break this $900 level where I would guess you're probably coming back into this sideways consolidation box between literally 550 and 800. Where it stops in there, I don't know, but I think you could come all the way back. Now, we could stop between 800 and 900 as well. And just for full transparency sake, I've been buying Tesla at these levels. I've been buying it at the 950, 930 level, both in my retirement account, which requires me to buy whole shares, but also in my son's account, which is much more convenient because I can do fractional shares. I think this is a good spot. If you're trying to accumulate Tesla, I think this is an interesting spot because we've got earnings coming up. There's a little bit of a risk, just like with all these stocks, as we move into earnings, how those announcements swing these stocks one way or another. So we'll see what happens with Tesla. But actually, I tell you what, out of all these stocks, this is the one at the most critical level right here at 900. If we don't hold 900 on Tesla, it's lookout below, but that's why you should be monitoring this one very quickly and very closely over the next two weeks. Like I talked about, every banker on Wall Street, especially the ones that are doing well and had a great year, which I would guess is the vast majority of them. They're going to be putting the, the, their their kids are going to be out of school. They're going to see their friends that have normal jobs. They're going to be on vacation too. Guess what they're going to be wanting to do? They're going to be wanting to kick their feet up on their sofa and kick back and relax. Watch bowl games, watch football, watch basketball, watch anything that they want to do. Watch their kids grow up in their backyard, take a break. 
uh, that could create buying opportunities in the stock market, okay? Just because Goldman Sachs bankers are taking the, the week off doesn't mean you need to. So hopefully that sets you up heading into next week. We'll be back with Nike earnings on Monday and the Fang Stock Recap Show back on Friday at our normal regular time. Thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you guys are having a great holiday as we head into it. Enjoy that time with your family. I appreciate all your support over this year. Thanks for tuning in. Good luck with your investments.